I've got some bad news for you right at the start. I hate to do this to you. But some of the really difficult, really hard to understand, almost impossible to understand parts of this passage, I'm going to breeze over as if it were easy to understand. Um, There's some really difficult things here. Go and totally destroy this people. And it makes it sound as if God's really mad at these people, the Amalekites, because they weren't nice to his people when they came through. And the whole totally destroy thing is very, very troubling. And he's specific about how he says to do it. Everything. Men, women, children, infants, animals, everything. And at some point we will talk about the sort of technical term used here. It's a giving over to the Lord. It is actually a sacrificial sort of term, which doesn't make it or shouldn't make it that much easier to bear. That God said, go and totally destroy this people. But it is part of the history that that goes into this whole story. But another time we will talk about that difficult thing. Because we have some other difficult things we're going to have to work through. So it's not as if I didn't realize that was horrible stuff. And Agag the king being killed in front of everybody, that's pretty horrible stuff. And it's not just like, well, that just happened in the ancient world. It should, I think, make us take pause and be a little troubled. But there's another sort of trouble that I do want us to talk about. It's a crisis of character. It's Saul's character. Saul was chosen, although he was a head taller than everybody else and handsome in features, That was not why he was chosen to be king. He was chosen to be king actually much more because of his heart. How he approached the world. How he approached God. How he approached being ruler and authority over God's people. He was humble. He was not ambitious. He was not greedy. He was not afraid of what people would say. uh, Guarding his reputation. And in just a few short chapters, Saul has changed entirely. And we're not done with Saul. And so if you want to be reading some of Samuel while I'm away, um, we're going to pick up much later uh, with some more about David. But David and Saul, David, right after where I stopped in chapter 16, David enters into Saul's service. And that's great. Except that the way that people respond to David instead of Saul makes Saul crazy. And I mean that in a couple of different senses. Saul has completely changed now, and we see a different man than we saw last week, the one the Lord picked, anointed, chose, but literally anointed with oil in order to lead his people. And his character has changed, or maybe his true character has come out. I think that there has been a change. Um, A lot of people have done a lot of damage with this, but you know, Lord Atherton is famous for saying, um, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I don't know if that's all that it is, but Saul is suddenly a power guy. He is concerned about how people feel. He is concerned about keeping people together. He is concerned about the way that he looks. But worst of all, Saul has turned into a liar. And he's a clever one at that. Well, almost clever. Um, It's not clever to try to lie to a prophet of God who is talking to the Lord and the Lord's talking to him and telling him things and telling him exactly what Saul's up to when he is hundreds of miles away. But we have a crisis of character. In the Lord's anointed one, the chosen one of God, a reluctance or maybe a refusal to obey the Lord wholeheartedly the way that he started out. Started out well and finished just horribly. This passage and this and sort of the whole point of what we're talking about today did not go the way that I expected. I wanted to talk about David. Isn't it exciting that this shepherd has become anointed as king and he's going to lead the people and he's going to have his bumps in the road along the way. But isn't it great? But all this passage has very much more to do with confession and with character, with the state of the heart. Maybe as someone who is supposed to rule over God's people, God's children, uh, it is appropriate on Father's Day to deal with this. But you notice even in our call to worship, we were confessing before we got to the confession and reminding ourselves of confession. And this is what Saul does particularly poorly along the way. Samuel has to keep peeling back layers of delusion and misrepresentation of self-justification and negotiation before we can get to the truth. This is an imperfect analogy, but it's a, such a vivid image that it may work because that was what I was thinking about. Saul keeps having to go, nope, not that, nope, not that. And, I mean, Samuel does to Saul, and finally Saul comes out with it. But in one of the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, uh, a young boy has the misfortune of turning into a dragon. And uh, that's particularly bad because all the people he was traveling with didn't really like him much in the first place. And then when he becomes a dragon, of course, he's terrifying, and nobody really likes dragons because they breathe fire and they can kill you. 
And so he's trying to get back to these people, the only people in this part of the world who can take care of him. But he has to try to convince them that he's not going to hurt them. And actually, this little boy they didn't like is now this real dragon that they can, cannot stand. But in the course of things, he tries to become undragoned uh, to get rid of this dragon that's, that is... Uh, become sort of a representation of his heart. It's a character thing. Um, Because of greed and because of resentment and because of uh, his sort of arrogance and egocentrism and selfishness, uh, this boy becomes a dragon. And when it comes to becoming undragoned, trying to get the dragon skin off, he finds that he cannot do it by himself. He scratches, and if you've ever seen a shed skin of a snake, you can imagine how uncomfortable it must be to, to at one time take off a whole layer of who you are and what you are and how difficult it must be to wriggle out. But if you're a dragon, it's even harder. Scales are harder. So he scratches himself, and he can get a little bit, but underneath it's still dragon, and underneath it's still dragon, until finally the Jesus, the Christ figure, shows up, Aslan the lion, and he says, you'll have to let me do this for you. And this is part of where confession leads us. Confession is an acknowledgement, but sometimes it does have to actually lead us to the point where we say, all right, Lord, no more lies, no more deception, no more hoping you'll think this and hoping you'll think that. It is time to tell the truth, and then I'll accept from you what comes. And what comes is amazing. What comes out of confession is forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Anyway, this little boy finally says, all right, you're going to have to do it. And uh, it's like when you go to the doctor and they say this might sting a bit. It was kind of like that. This may be a little uncomfortable, meaning this is going to be excruciatingly painful, but I don't want you to be worried about it. And so the lion comes and is able to tear off this dragon skin and underneath is a boy, but he's a changed boy, a transformed person who now knows forgiveness, who now understands exactly what state he was in before and now is determined to live differently and does for the rest of the course of the story, all the way to the very end of the last battle. Samuel, we don't have such a good ending, a happy ending to his story. Samuel is lying and and deceiving and all along the way, and in ways that you wouldn't necessarily even pick up on along the way. Okay, what does he do? Because what he says is, well, we did destroy this army, and I brought back the king in disgrace, and we've captured him. And, well, yeah, we brought back some of the sheep and some of the cattle, but we're going to sacrifice with them. I hope you could tell. I, I, you know, Some people say that when a pastor is reading Scripture, I should not read it with any feeling or emotion. I just should read the words just straight so that you can take in the meaning because it's God's holy word. And I think if I do that, particularly if I read you a chapter and a half, Three quarters of you will be asleep by the end, and you won't necessarily be able to figure out what it is uh, that is intended. Also drives me crazy, by the way, when you hear poets, poets whom you like reading their own work. For some reason, in public poetry readings, it is the thing to read them just kind of flat and monotonal and let you put the meaning in. But if you mean something by your poem, I want to hear it when you read it to me. So I was reading this with great sarcasm when when Saul kept telling Samuel, oh, no, 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 we were going to sacrifice. That's what we meant to do. And, oh, I was really scared of those soldiers. So here are some of the lies and deceptions that Samuel has to peel off Saul along the way. The Lord has already told Samuel what Saul did, and Saul still thinks he can get away with it. So when Samuel shows up, oh, that's even the first problem that that Saul has. Samuel goes looking for Saul, the victorious king. He's hard to find. He's having to chase him around the countryside. Why? Saul doesn't want to meet Samuel. He is hoping that Samuel just get tired and go back home. He's an old man after all. If I go to enough places, maybe he'll go away. So he goes looking for him, but he's gone. He's gone to Carmel, the mountain near the sea. And then it sounds as if he starts his way and they go, no, 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 he's left there now. Now he's gone down to Gilgal. Saul is running all over the countryside to avoid Samuel. When Samuel reaches him, Saul decides, I'd better make this good. The Lord bless you. I did everything the Lord told me to do. Just pleased as punch, proud as he could be, hoping Samuel go, well, good for you, Saul. Well done. But Samuel knows. I've carried out the Lord's instructions. Why then do I hear all these sheep bleeding? Why do I hear all these cattle lowing? Oh, yeah, 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 sure. I mean, we brought back some of them, but we destroyed everything we were supposed to. But the best, the best stuff we brought back and we were going to sacrifice. Now, it sounds as if he's a good religious, pious fellow. But remember, what's going to happen in a sacrifice is you're going to offer this to God and then you're going to get to eat most of it. Give a little bit to the priest, but it's for your own feasting. They weren't concerned with sacrifice. They were concerned with themselves. Samuel said, you were once small, even in your own eyes, 
and God raised you up as king. And he told you to go and destroy them completely. And you didn't do it. I love this phrase. Why did you pounce on the plunder? He grabbed for himself and let the soldiers grab for themselves. And he goes, no, 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 that's not what happened. Well, he starts out saying, I have sinned. He doesn't mean it. I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. But, but look, I was really scared of these guys. I was afraid of the men. So I gave in to them. It was their idea. The Lord has made you king over the people of Israel. Yeah, but you know, they're scary. Wasn't scared before. Well, now forgive me and then come back with me. We'll worship God together. Everything's going to be all right, Samuel, right? And Samuel says, no, I'm not going back. You rejected the word of the Lord. And now the Lord has rejected you as king. Saul has confessed a couple of times. I didn't quite get it right. Oh, no, I sinned. Oh, I gave in to the people. And now he's starting to see the depth of his sin and the real state of his condition. Samuel's about to leave him. And Saul reaches out, grabs him by the hem of his robe. Saul is probably on the ground at this point before the prophet. And he reaches out and grabs him. But when he does, he rips the robe. This is so poignant. I, I, it's hard even to, to, to fill it up with enough meaning for us. When somebody is truly contrite or heartbroken or grieving or repenting in the ancient world, they would tear their own clothes. Saul doesn't tear his clothes. He tears Samuel's clothes, the prophet. He tears Samuel's robe and Samuel says, okay, here's an object lesson for you. Just as you have torn my robe, the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to somebody else. Saul finally gets it right. I have sinned. And this time he means it. Please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. You've been honored a lot, Saul. People are impressed with what you did. You went and set up a whole statue to yourself, a monument to yourself, not to God, but to yourself. So maybe not entirely changed. But this is as good as we're going to get. This is the best apology we're getting out of Saul, the best confession I have sinned, but please come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. I didn't think much of this uh, during the course of the week when I was reading, but Saul makes a change in his language. It is no longer the Lord my God or the Lord our God. As soon as Samuel shows up, he starts talking about the Lord your God. Well, what happened to Saul and God? Saul seems to have turned away from the Lord. Let me worship the Lord your God. Not our God, not my God, but yours. Saul has turned away. In a remarkable way. Samuel, on the other hand, is mourning over this situation. As soon as he hears about it, he's angry. He cries out to the Lord all night long. Now that he has left Saul and will never see him again, he mourns for him. We don't know how long, but finally the Lord's like, all right, it's time to move on. Yes, Saul did wrong. And yes, he was the chosen one. And yes, I know what a big mess he has made of things. But how long are you going to mourn for him? He is no longer going to be king. Remarkably, God makes him king for the rest of Saul's life. He tears away the kingdom, but Saul is going to be king, knowing that his future is limited, knowing that somebody's going to succeed him, somebody whom the Lord has chosen in his place. But he is not zapped. He is not uh, destroyed. He is not uh, brought to an untimely death. For the rest of his life, he is king, but he is a lame duck king the whole way. Because God is not with him the way that he was going to be and the way that he had been. Well, we finally get to the good stuff, right? We finally get to the interesting story. And I blew it by uh, telling you who uh, Eliab was, the first son. But the way that it's told, we know that David's going to show up. And everyone who is hearing this for the first time, for the first time, not just the millionth time today in 2015, they know this story is about David. But the way it's told, his name doesn't come into it at all. Samuel, go to Jesse of Bethlehem, and then you're going to go through all these sons, Eliab and Abinadab and all the seven sons, and don't you have any more sons? And it's not until the very last verse, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon, who is this young son? Who is this shepherd who was out in the fields? Who is this one whom the Lord has chosen? The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And then we get to hear who it is. This is the good news in the midst of the bad. Good news also, by the way, is that this one, this young man, young, young man, the shepherd who is chosen, is the one who wrote the psalm that was our call to worship, that cries out for God to forgive sin and to create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David, who is still fallen and frail and sinful and broken, and we will see that writ large. When David messes up, he messes up really big. But David also comes back to the Lord really strongly. 
God calls him the one, a man after my own heart, a man after God's own heart. After telling Samuel, the Lord doesn't look at the outward appearance like all you people do. The Lord looks at the heart. God knows whom he's choosing based on who the person is, not just how the world perceives. And the Lord looks at the heart. And this is somebody who is a man after God's own heart. So in the midst of his sinfulness, he will, it will put that on painful display, the ways his foibles and uh, his fallenness. But his confession shows the state of his heart. When David says, I'm sorry, he's really, really sorry. He sometimes has to be led to the truth. We'll see that when the prophet Nathan comes to talk to him along the way. But David confesses his sin. God forgives his sin. And from David's line comes another anointed one. Saul, anointed with oil by Samuel, set apart as king. David, in the midst of this sort of secret mission that Samuel has to go on to make sure that Saul doesn't find out and kill him, Samuel anoints David as the next king. But it's going to be a while before that comes about. But once he is king, from his line will come one who is also the anointed one. Because in Hebrew, anointed one is the word Messiah, Mashiach. Messiah, anointed one, the chosen one who is not going to come and be powerful and yet also frail and fallen, not someone who comes and can lead but also has these horrible character flaws and weaknesses, but one is going to come who will be the obedient, sinless one, who takes our sins upon himself, who does not take the sacrifice and place of the prophet, somehow taking the things of the holy things of God as if they weren't holy, but he is the holy one of God and becomes the sacrifice for us. So in the midst of our story here of kings and God and God working in time and history, what we see now is it's the turning and the road. What we see now is the sun beginning to dawn. And unfortunately, we're going to have some really dark times in between now and when David actually becomes king. And David and Saul are not going to get along and Saul's going to try to kill him a lot. And David will not kill Saul because he's the anointed one, God's chosen one. And he respects that, God's choice, and will not kill him when he gets the opportunity. I think we're going to have to skip over all that uh, until we get later in the story. But this is where we go. The dawning of something new from David's line. David, who comes from the tribe of Judah, will come the Lion of Judah, Jesus Christ, our Savior. The one who has nothing to confess, but rather the one who takes our sins upon himself so that when we confess, we can be healed and forgiven. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord, in the midst of the story, help us to see your hand at work and not in the ways that it's so tempting to see, uh, that you are a vengeful God wanting to get rid of certain peoples, that you are a God who changes your mind and regrets what you've done, but rather a God who works through us, through people who are fallen and frail, who make wrong choices, uh, sometimes people who deceive ourselves and try to deceive you uh, by our justifications, uh, by our dissimulations by our trying to uh, say something in such a way that we will never get to the heart of the matter. But you know our hearts. You look at our hearts. And you wish to forgive us of all of our sins. For that purpose, you sent your son to be the sacrifice once and for all. For that, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.